All right, well, good morning, Westwood Church. My name is Luke Burns, and I am the director of high school ministry here, and I am honored to be able to preach the Word of God to you all this morning. As Pastor Quinn already mentioned, we are in part three of a three-part series titled Life After Christmas, where we take a look at one of the greatest paradoxes of the entire Bible. The fact that Jesus Christ, also called the Prince of Peace, lived one of the least peace-filled lives that you could possibly imagine. The Prince of Peace's life was filled with chaos, it was filled with rejection, it was filled with pain and suffering and even violence and bloodshed. But yet, despite all of this, Jesus' mission to continue to spread peace and truth in the world continued even in the face of adversity. And as Christians, we are called to continue that mission in the world as well. And so that's what we'll be diving into today. But before I get too deep into that, I will say that when Pastor Quinn presented me with the opportunity to preach over Luke chapter 4 today, I was instantly very excited because I think this particular passage of Scripture really comes to life when you take a look at the historical background of what was going on at the time. And that's something that I just absolutely love to do. You know, I think there's more than meets the eye to me and Pastor Quinn. We're more alike than meets the eye. Um, and despite our very apparent differences in, I'll call it altitude, um, <laughs> we both are uh, absolutely love studying the Word of God. And I think it's safe to say that we are both uh, Bible history nerds. And so today I'd like to channel my inner Quinn, if I could, and I'd like to start the sermon out with a fun and hopefully interesting historical story that ties everything together. So that's where I'd like to start. So in 2016, I graduated from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln with a degree in classics. And for those of you who don't know what classics is, classics is the study of ancient Greek and Roman religion, mythology, history, and literature. And I also have a degree in religious studies and ancient history. So I am a history and religion nerd through and through. And to prove to you just how nerdy I really am, one of my favorite things to do in college was I would go to the university bookstore and I would look at textbooks for classes that I didn't have room in my schedule to actually take. And if the textbook looked interesting enough, I would buy it and I would read it even if I wasn't taking that class. So that's a little bit nerdy. And so that's what I was doing one day in the university bookstore. And I knew I had a favorite professor. And so I went over to where I knew his books were and I wanted to see what other books he was recommending for his students. And I came across this book that just looked amazing. And I have to admit, I was completely judging this book by the title and by the cover. But it looked like something I would really enjoy. It looked a little bit mysterious. It looked historical. It looked uh, a little bit philosophical, which are all things that I really love. So I bought the book, and I'm glad I did, because as it turns out, this book would become my all-time favorite book, and it still is to this very day. This book is called The Consolation of Philosophy by a man named Boethius. Now, this book is, uh, was originally written in Latin, and it was originally written in ancient Rome. And this year, in the year 2023, this book turns exactly 1,500 years old. So it's an old book, but it's a beautiful book, and it's got great imagery in it. And the whole first half of the book is about the randomness and the perplexity of fate and fortune. And Boethius imagines fortune as a woman, and he calls her Lady Fortune. Now, this is similar to what the author of the book of Proverbs does in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with that book, where he personifies wisdom as Lady Wisdom. But Boethius personifies fortune as Lady Fortune. And as the story goes, Lady Fortune stands over your bed at night while you sleep periodically throughout your life, and she spins a wheel. Now, this is the story, interestingly enough, that popularized the phrase, the wheel of fortune, like the game show. And so she spins her wheel, and if it lands on blessings, then you're going to have blessings for the next season of your life. But if it lands on curses, you're going to have curses for the next season of your life. Now, this is obviously not the way fate and fortune really work in the world. There is not really a woman spinning a wheel by your bedside. But I think it is a pretty good way of thinking about something that all human beings wrestle with in life. And that is 
that we all at some point in our life have thought about, why does it seem like, despite my best efforts, sometimes bad things just happen to me? Sometimes I just have bad luck, no matter what I do. Sometimes the opposite of that is true as well, where we just have strings of really good luck and we don't really know why. And so that's what the whole first half of this book is talking about. It's talking about how life is a series of ups and downs. And sometimes we know why, but sometimes we don't know why. It's totally random. Now, I know you all may be thinking that's a nice little story, but what in the world does this have to do with Jesus? And what does this have to do with Luke chapter 4? Well, I think it proves a point that human beings all go through ups and downs in life. But Jesus Christ... The Son of God, God incarnate, went through the ups and downs of life as well. He held fate and fortune in his hand, and he could have chosen not to go through any of the bad moments, but he went through them anyway because he is a God that sympathizes with us. He's a God that understands what we go through, and he chose to go through the ups and downs of life as well. Now, in our sermon series this week, Life After Christmas, we've taken a look at some very difficult moments in Jesus' life. Last week, we took a look at the temptation in the wilderness, and we saw what kind of temptation and difficulty and trial that was for Jesus. But today, in our scripture passage, we have another passage where things just aren't going well for Jesus. He goes back to his hometown, and initially he is praised, but then a few verses later, the same people that praise him reject him and want to kill him. So so with that, I would like to read the word of God this morning. Would we all be able to stand as I read the scriptures? Now the words will be on the screen, but if you'd like to follow along in the Bibles in front of you, we are on page 783. We are reading Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. So starting at verse 14, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them, The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over a cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Today, guide us. May our mind be open and our hearts receptive to what you'll have for us today. Guide us through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, this is a, certainly an interesting passage of scripture, I think. It goes from Jesus going in his own hometown and people are praising him. And then by the time it ends, the people want to kick Jesus off a cliff. What in the world is going on? Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back through the scripture passage that we just read little by little and analyze what was going on and see if we can not understand a little bit more of why were the people so angry at Jesus? What did he do to offend them so much that they wanted to kill him? So starting at verse 14, 
It says, Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Now, Luke, in his gospel, wants you to know everywhere Jesus goes, he is filled with the Spirit. At the beginning of the temptation, it says, the Spirit led Jesus out of the wilderness, or into the wilderness, and the Spirit was with him. And now, again, the Spirit is with Jesus as he goes into Galilee. So that's very important to Luke's gospel. It says, he taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So this is a pretty good start. Jesus starts out, and he's being praised by everyone. Not too bad. And then he comes to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, and he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. Now, this is very common in the ancient Jewish culture around the time. This is what Jewish rabbis would do. When they went to the synagogue, they would usually read two passages of scripture. The first passage came from the law, which is what we would consider the first five books of the Old Testament. So they'd read a passage from that. And then they would read a passage from one of the prophets. And so that's what Jesus is doing. He's not doing anything strange here. He is just doing what all Jewish rabbis do. And he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and then he reads that passage. And I'm going to read that one more time because I think this is a big clue in figuring out why the people got so angry at Jesus. So it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then he rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant, and he sits down. And then the Bible tells us all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Now, why would they be looking at him intently? Well, because it was also a common practice for ancient Jewish rabbis. After they read a passage of Scripture, they would sit down, and then they would give an interpretation of that passage of Scripture. And there was a certain way that ancient rabbis had to do this. It was part of the protocol of how they were supposed to interpret Scripture. What they were supposed to do is they were supposed to list other rabbis that interpreted the Scripture in a certain way, and they would quote them before giving their interpretation. So an example of this would be if you were reading Isaiah, you would give the reading, and then you would say, now the interpretation of this, according to Rabbi, bum, 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 they'd give his name, and according to Rabbi, and they would give another name, this is how you are supposed to interpret it. It was kind of an ancient way of citing your sources. The interesting thing about Jesus is that he never did this. He never did what most rabbis do. He never cited his sources. He was his own authority whenever he was interpreting an Old Testament passage. That's why in Matthew's gospel, we have examples like, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? What they're talking about is Jesus is interpreting Old Testament passages, and he is the sole uh, authority in interpreting it. So that's why all of the eyes in the synagogue are looking at Jesus, is because they want to know, what is he about to say about this passage. And what he says does not disappoint. He says, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. This is a pretty amazing thing to hear because the prophet Isaiah was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And he's in the synagogue and everyone's looking at him and he's saying, in this scripture that's hundreds of years old, today is the day that it's being fulfilled. And in there was kind of a hidden secret that, and it was Jesus. That was kind of implied. Jesus is the fulfillment of this scripture. And it says that everyone was amazed and couldn't believe what they were saying. And they said, well, isn't this just Joseph's son? Matthew's gospel words it, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son and aren't his brothers and sisters here with us? What they're essentially saying is, but we know Jesus. He grew up here. This is Nazareth where he grew up. We, we know his mother, his father, his brothers and sisters. He's just a normal guy, right? He's the one that's going to be the Messiah. This was absolutely crazy to them, but this seems weird to me because if you remember just a few chapters earlier, we talked about the birth of Jesus where wise men from the east came bearing gifts and Jesus' birth was so amazing it was announced by angels and, and King Herod wanted to kill all newborn babies ages two and under because he was so offended at the birth of Jesus. You would think that everybody would understand, everybody would know that Jesus is somebody special. But their response here makes it sound like Jesus isn't really all that special. They're amazed that he's the one. They say, well, isn't this just Joseph's son? 
They're not either, they're not, they don't know that Jesus is somebody special, or they don't truly believe that he's something special. And Jesus kind of reads their mind a little bit, and he says, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is where Jesus started his ministry after the death of John the Baptist. He did many miracles there. He cast out demons. He healed many sick people. So it was a place that he did a lot of miraculous things. And essentially what the people were saying is if you're going to interpret the passage this way and you're going to claim that you're the Messiah, you have to prove it to us by doing a bunch of miracles. That's what they wanted Jesus to do. And then he says, but I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. And then he goes on to give two examples of Old Testament prophets where they blessed people, but they blessed foreigners. They didn't bless Jewish people. And what Jesus was saying here is that I'm the Messiah. I am coming to bring God's kingdom, and you all are missing it. Now, this would have been incredibly offensive to them. This is not what they wanted to hear at all. And that is why they wanted to cast him out and kick him off of a cliff because they had the wrong idea of who the Messiah was supposed to be. Jews at this point in time believed that the Messiah was going to be someone like King David, who was an earthly warrior and king, who would cast out the Romans and Israel would be a sovereign nation once again, and that the Messiah would sit on a real earthly throne and the blessings of God would come to the Messiah and then they would go on the nation of Israel. So that's what they were thinking was going to happen. But here was Jesus looking them in the eye face to face, and he was essentially saying, actually, that's not how my kingdom is going to work. My kingdom is not going to be an earthly one, but it's one established by the Holy Spirit. And, it's, and I'm going to come into the hearts of all believers and change your heart. And it's not just for Jewish people, but now it's for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. And I think this is something that they really had a hard time accepting. This was very, very difficult for them. And I think this brings us to the main point in this passage, and that is, if you want to truly worship Jesus, you can't worship him for what you want him to be, but you have to worship Jesus for who he truly is. And where do you go to find out who he truly is? You go to the pages of the Bible. And I think that's something that happens in our culture a lot these days, is that people worship Jesus, but they worship a Jesus that is unfamiliar to this book. It's a Jesus that is more of the imagination than the true historical Jesus. And I think that was their problem. They thought they knew what the Messiah was supposed to be like, but he wasn't that way. But yet, despite all of this, despite being cast out and almost killed, Jesus' mission to spread truth and peace in the world continued. He didn't give up. Can you imagine if Jesus' ministry would have ended here? If he would have said, you know what, this is, this is a little bit too dangerous. I'm not going to continue. I'm not going to go through with it. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to have that same exact mission to spread truth and peace in this world, even in the face of adversity. I think one of my favorite things about the Bible is that it was written for just the average person. It was written mostly to farmers and people who were in the agricultural community. And a, a certain agricultural phrase that I like the most is that of sowing seeds. The Bible talks about this from time to time. And I like that because the farmer is only responsible for sowing the seed. The farmer's not responsible for making sure it rains, the farmer's not responsible for making sure the sun shines. The farmer's not responsible for making sure there's nutrients in the soil. The farmer is only responsible for spreading the seed. God does the rest. God handles the rest. God is the one that raises up the crop. And I think that is true in our lives as well. That when we want to be people who are sowing seeds of truth and peace and kindness and love and mercy in the world we have to realize that we are not responsible for how other people interpret what we're saying. We are only responsible for spreading those seeds. God is the one who does the rest. God is the one that will raise up the crop. And we are called to continue no matter what. Be just like our Savior and not give up and continue to spread 
truth and peace and love in this world. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are a God that sympathizes with us. You are a God that goes through the ups and downs of life. And even though this, what we read today in this passage was not a glorious moment, it's something that you went through and you persevered through because you had so much in store for these people. The people in the synagogue of Nazareth, they wanted to get to know you, but they couldn't get past that you were different than they thought. Jesus, your gospel, your good news is for everybody in the whole world. And all we have to do is believe it. And once we have your love in our hearts, our mission is to spread that love to others as well. Jesus, we love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.